When guys find out that I'm a sports handicapper, they always want advice. And I understand that. They want tips. They want strategy. They want winners. But listen, the greatest advice that I can impart upon them and you is a philosophy that has served me well over the years, and that's this. Accept the fact that when you're gambling, you're going to lose. And sometimes you're going to lose day after day. And sometimes you're going to lose for a couple of weeks. And sometimes you're going to have losing months. Forget about that pie in the sky that you're going to win all the time. It just doesn't happen. Losing is a part of life when it comes to gambling. Accept it. But also remember this. Scared money always finds the losers on the board. And what I mean reflects on what I said in yesterday's video report. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I had raised the bar 20 dime releases. And you know my strategy. When I'm winning, I do not take my foot off that accelerator. I do not back away from a winning hand. I keep pressing the action. So on Monday night, there was a play I loved. And I came back with another 20 dime raise the bar release. Only the 21st such selection I've had over the past three years that high because as you know, 15 dime plays are my highest rated plays normally. And I lost with the Dodgers minus $1.45 at home against Milwaukee. Did I play scared yesterday? No, I told you there was another play on the board that I absolutely loved. I had been winning like crazy. And I came back with another 20 dime play because that's what the play warranted. I had a bankroll accumulated. I think I had won 21 of the previous 31 days. I didn't play scared and it paid off. A 20 dime raised the bar playing number four out of five since Friday on Philadelphia as a dollar 35 underdog winning outright at Boston. Now, I would be sitting here today, whether I won or lost with Philadelphia last night, giving you the same speech. Don't let scared money dictate how you're going to play the following day. I'm telling you, you're not in here to lose. Otherwise, why would you be gambling? So yesterday on the video report, I also gave you a free winner on the Oakland A's. 46 and 27 roll with the complimentary plays. I've got two more selections tonight. Colorado, St. Louis and Atlanta, Miami with the comp plays. My best bet happened to be a 20 dime play on the early card. The big feature play I would tell you for the nighttime card would be from Steve Budin's Cali Cartel. They are on a 13 and 4 run over the past five weeks with 50 dime selections, including a winner last night with those Oakland A's. And you've gotten them all at uh, the majority of them for at least half price off. Tonight, their second 100 dime baseball release of the season. They hit their first one last Friday with the uh, Angels 4 3 over Seattle. You got it for over half price off. Their second one goes tonight. You get it for over half price off by using coupon code CALI. C-A-L-I. All your other discounts, etc. are over on the home page. But before we go any further, let's talk about and have some fun with this day in history. Okay, amusement park fans, today, 1961, Six Flags Over Texas opened in Arlington, Texas. It was the first of the Six Flag chain. Uh, pioneered the concept, of course, of the single day admission price rather than the separate entrance fee and then paying per ride using tickets. Uh, by the way, just to make you sick, back in 1961, the admission for an adult to Six Flags, Texas, was $2.75. The child's admission price was $2.25. And remember, that's to ride all the rides for a day, right? A hamburger cost 50 cents and a soda cost a dime. Uh, if you're ever wondering where Six Flags came from, the name, because at one time, over the years, there were six different flags that flew over the state of Texas, not only the United States flag, but the flags of France, Spain, Mexico, and the Confederacy, and um, of course the state flag of Texas as well. Um, sad news in 1966, uh, on this date in Austin, Texas, uh, a deranged lunatic by the name of Charles Whitman climbed the tower on the University of Texas campus and uh, took a high-powered rifle. He was an outstanding marksman. He shot 46 people, killing 14 that day, and eventually another one of the wounded uh, succumbed to the injuries he suffered that day in 2001, and he had killed his wife and mother uh, the night before in uh, 1981, today. 
uh, MTV launched. I remember uh, we were very lucky enough, my family, to be in an area in suburban Philadelphia where we actually had cable TV. I remember watching the launch of MTV uh, that day. Uh, that was really a cool thing, uh, watching music videos, this new genre, a new art form of that day. Uh, going back a little further, something a little more important than MTV. In 1964, the Beatles' A Hard Day's Night took over the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. And which song did it replace? Knocking out of the top spot, Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons, Ragdoll, which fell to number two on the chart, rounding out the top five on this day in 1964 on the Billboard Top 100 chart. Coming in number three, Jan and Dean's The Little Old Lady from Pasadena. Number four, Dean Martin. Everybody loves somebody sometime. Hey. I'm just passing it on the news, you know? And number five, The Supremes, Where Did Our Love Go? What a diverse top five. Uh, by the way, The Beatles, uh, the first, the first artist, group, etc., to hold the number one spot on the album and singles chart simultaneously in the United Kingdom and the USA because of the album, also named The Hard Day's Night. Uh, first group and only group to do so uh, an artist to do so until Simon and Garfunkel came along in 1970 with Bridge Over Troubled Water. Uh, of course, Hard Day's Night, who can forget the opening chord? Uh, George Harrison, that famous opening chord. Uh, I can tell you that uh, 2016 tour, Paul McCartney, the one-on-one -on -one tour, um, that was the fifth time I had seen McCartney with my son. Uh, he had just graduated from college and uh, we were looking for a place on the tour to go and see him because his girlfriend had never seen McCartney. So we settled on a place, Bossier City, Louisiana, because we had never been to Bossier City, Louisiana, but it was convenient. So we flew into Dallas. <laughs> this is sick, right? Flew into Dallas, drove three and a half, four hours over to Bossier City, uh, Louisiana, which is right on the outskirts of Shreveport. My son and his girlfriend and myself went to the concert. My wife, of course, passed on seeing McCartney for a fifth time. She instead minute she knew there were like eight casinos in Shreveport, she said, see, I'll drop you off. I'll come back for you five hours later. Yeah. Believe me, the amount of money she lost that night, the tickets were probably cheaper to see McCartney. Um, but that was the tour where McCartney, for the first time, performed it. Uh, actually, he was the first Beatle as a solo artist to perform A Hard Day's Night since the group itself played it in their last public concert at the Cow Palace uh, in Daly City, which is uh, on the outskirts of San Francisco in their final public concert, I think it was August 31st, 1965. Um, so that was really cool. I mean, uh, hearing the crowd when they heard that opening chord, it was, I mean, pandemonium in Bossier City, Louisiana. Uh, and then rounding out this day in history, a little personal thing, and Paramount Pictures in 1953 released what uh, many consider one of the greatest, if not the greatest Western movie of all time, the movie Shane, uh, starring Alan Ladd, and um, just a great, great film, and personal matter to me. Um, my first name is actually Alan, spelled the same way. There's a number of ways to spell it, A-L-A-N. And I was named after Alan Ladd because it was my father's favorite actress. And when I was born, my mother had my father look through the baby book, the baby name book, and it was the fifth name down and picked Alan because his favorite actor was Alan Ladd. So there you go. Let's move on to the complimentary plays. Uh, I'm going to go with the Colorado Rockies because why not? They've made everybody money. They've won 20 of their last 26 games. Last night taking a 6-3 decision over the Cardinals who were held to just four hits in the game. And that's really been the Cardinals' problem all season. Inconsistent offense. Colorado, a 115-120 dog tonight in this game. Going with Kyle Friedland who is 3-0 with a 2.24 earned run average in his last eight starts. Made five starts in the month of July. Rockies won all five of those starts. He had a 2.54 earned run average in them. Coming off an outstanding start against a then red-hot Oakland A's team last Friday in Coors Field. Six innings of uh, shutout ball. And remember, the A's came into that series last week in Denver having swept the Rangers in Arlington. And they scored like 47 runs in that four-game series. 
Uh, Luke Weaver is going for St. Louis. Yeah, he pitched well against the Chicago Cubs in his last start at home, beating uh, the Cubbies at Bush Stadium with six innings of eight hit, two run ball. But keep in mind, that only improved his record at home at Bush Stadium this season to one and four with a 5.04 earn run average in nine home starts for a Cardinals team that is only one little game over 500. And the Cardinals were a seller, as you saw at the trade deadline. Looking forward to next season, it obviously seems rather than trying to cut that deficit of seven and a half games in the NL Central. So I'm going to go with Hot Colorado, a team that got off to such a horrible start this season but has really turned on the Jets over the past six weeks. And your other complimentary play, I like Atlanta, plus $1.10 to $1.15, laying the one and a half runs on the run line at home tonight against the Miami Marlins. Marlins going with the rookie Pablo Lopez, who is making his sixth start through his first five. He has a 5.34 earned run average after allowing four runs runs in five and two-third innings and his last start at home against Washington on Friday. Annabelle Sanchez going for the Braves. He has a 2.61 earn run average in seven outings. Six of them starts at home for the Braves this season. Had a 3.48 earn run average in five July starts for Atlanta despite getting roughed up a little bit at home last Friday, last Thursday by the Dodgers, a game in which the Dodgers reached him for five runs in six and a third innings. Marlins 12 games under 500 on the road. They lost last night 11-6 in the opener of the series, a game in which the Braves had 19 hits to improve to 8-3 and three in the season series. And listen, the Braves right now are a confident team, a team whose locker room was bolstered with all the recent additions. They go out and get Adam Duval from the Breds, the big power hitting outfielder. They go and improve their pitching staff, getting Kevin Galsman and Darren O'Day from the O's, Brad Bach from the O's as well, Johnny Venters to improve their bullpen from Tampa Bay. You know, when I was a reporter, I was there and I was in locker rooms after um, the trade deadline and after teams went out, whether it be in the NBA or in baseball, and seeing that locker room when a team has gone out and seen their front office make acquisitions to bolster their playoff hopes, or the flip side, when you've seen a team basically throw up the white flag and seen uh, veterans depart and you realize there's nothing left to play for and the season's over and it's wait till next year. I've seen the highs and I've seen the lows and right now the Atlanta Braves are in that former category so I think that definitely will help them too tonight and the bet online is they've got the better pitcher and the, the better team so I'm willing to lay the one and a half runs here to get them at a slight underdog price at home. Of the two plays, I, I think they're pretty much equal. Colorado and the Braves on the run line. I like them both tonight as your complimentary selections. That'll do it. And again, talk to you again tomorrow.